Continue on unnamed road, then, in 300 feet, turn off your headlights. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I just wanted to give a massive thank you and shout out to everyone that has found the channel in the recent couple of months. Uh, I never thought that this channel would grow to 50,000 subscribers, but that is what we have been able to achieve. So I just want to thank each and every single one of you that stumbled upon the channel and my videos and has deemed me worthy enough to subscribe to my little channel. It means a lot to me. I also wanted to just provide a quick explanation for my absence. Uh, after the holidays, things really picked up with my family's small business and with tax season and everything going on, I had to direct my attention away from YouTube and content creation to be able to help with that. But now we're in a better place where I can pull away from that and direct my attention again towards YouTube and creating content. So I'm really excited to be doing that and I'm excited to be able to invest a little bit more in my setup so I can continue to create quality videos each time I upload. And again, just massive thank you from the bottom of my heart for everyone who has subscribed and who likes the videos. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate the feedback, even though I might not always respond to it. I definitely see your guys guys' comments and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to write me and to watch my videos. So I hope you guys have a great day and enjoy today's video. Number one, tunnels of death. The first video featured in our countdown is a piece of found footage that was recovered deep in the catacombs of Paris, France. For those who don't know, the catacombs are a series of underground tunnels that are located underneath Paris. The catacombs were created during the late 18th century to help alleviate the city cemetery shortage crisis, and as of 2022, there are approximately 6 million bodies buried in the catacombs. In more recent times, the catacombs have become a popular place for urban explorers and cave expeditions. Back in the 1990s, an unidentified man entered the catacombs to shoot some footage on his black and white camcorder. It is unknown whether the man entered the catacombs through an official entryway or use a restricted entrance to make it into the underground tunnels. The footage starts off randomly with the man exploring the catacombs and as the video goes on, the man begins to walk at a faster pace and eventually begins to run, almost as if he's running away from someone or something. He appears to be disoriented and in a state of panic before he finally drops the camera and runs off into the distance. The footage was recovered by a group of cave explorers and then a filmmaker by the name of Francis Freeland acquired the rights to the video. Not long afterwards, the footage was featured on the second episode of the ABC family show Scariest Places on Earth back in the year 2000. Some people believe the footage was a hoax concocted by either ABC family or by Francis Freeland. The suspicion is warranted considering the episode aired about a year after the release of the found footage horror film The Blair Witch Project. Individuals thought it might be a potential publicity stunt as it would be highly unlikely that the footage of a man's last moments was shown on a national television show rather than being handed over to the proper authorities. However, there is still a large group of believers in favor of the footage being real. To this day, nobody has claimed to be the individual in the tape after the initial airing of the episode over two decades ago. Also, Francis Freeland has confirmed that the man in the video is still missing. Assuming the found footage is real, there is still the probing question of what happened to the man in the video. When reviewing the footage, Freeland appears just as baffled by what could have driven the man to abandon his camera and take off running without any source of light in the distance. This video camera was found deep in the catacombs. It was picked up by a catacomb explorer, some of the people who wandered down there. 
It was given to me. I looked at the tape. It's very bizarre. It's a point of view shot. The point of view shot is somebody just walking forwards with the camera. So basically, he's filming what he's seeing. Endless. Very deep inside the catacombs. Other than the point of view shots are pictures of bones. Human bones. And these were the poor Parisians who died over the last thousand years. Person occasionally stops and he photographs bones, often in the shape of an arrow. These arrows point in a direction. Occasionally also, he stops to photograph roomfuls of bones, which means that he's very, very deep inside the catacombs. What happened to him? Nobody knows. Determined himself to solve the mystery of what he calls very bizarre footage, Freeland commissioned a group of explorers of the catacombs, referred to as cataphiles, to see if they could retrace the man's journey. So I brought the tape to a cataphile, an urban explorer. Cataphiles are strange people, the people who have this passion for the catacombs. These people go down there to find new passages, new entries, new bones, new, new skeletons. Lazar is probably the person in Paris who knows the catacombs better than, than anyone. So according to Lazar, the person is not someone who, who knew his way around. My intention right now is to go down with uh, a still photographer, Vincent, a friend. I'm also going to take uh, an excellent sound man, Francis, to spend some time in the catacombs and try to solve the mystery. No success came of the endeavor, and researching this case doesn't come up with many results. The tunnels that make up the catacombs are between 150 to 200 miles long, and it is relatively easy for anyone to get lost in the tunnels if they tried hard enough to take the restricted pass. For example, two teenagers had to be rescued from the catacombs after being stranded for three days inside the passages. Since the average temperature within the catacombs can fall below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it's safe to assume that the man in the video managed to get disoriented before possibly dying of hypothermia. However, it is unlikely that a camcorder and tape could have survived very long without being affected by the weather conditions inside the catacombs. To add more skepticism to the tape's validity, I also found a post on Reddit claiming that the reality show the video was featured on was known to fabricate storylines. For example, a Redditor posted about a friend who was hired by Scariest Places on Earth on a different episode to play the real-life friend of a victim in a featured story. It'd be one thing if the actress was asked to play the friend in a dramatization or reenactment, but they wanted the actress to talk to the camera in a sit-down style interview and act as if the experiences had actually happened to her in real life. They basically wanted her to fabricate her identity and falsely admit to being part of a story she was never a part of. Given the anecdotal evidence outweighs any real life circumstances, you can be the judge if we are really witnessing the last moments of this man's life before he panics himself into an early grave. So basically he's filming what he's seeing. Endless, very deep inside the catacombs. Human bones. These were the poor Parisians who died over the last thousand years. These arrows point in a direction. Occasionally also, he stops to photograph roomfuls of bones, which means that he's very, very deep inside the catacombs. What happened to him? Nobody knows. Number two, final destination. There's a YouTube channel named Local 58 TV created by an individual named Chris Straub. At the time of recording this video, the channel has 510,000 subscribers and nine videos uploaded to its video library. It has been sporadically active for the past four years and the one clip I have chosen to include in the countdown is one called you are on the fastest route available. I encourage you to watch it in a dark room and allow yourself to get really immersed in the experience of the video. If you've ever driven late at night in an unfamiliar location and panicked to get to any sign of civilization, this will trigger and amplify that experience tenfold. The video starts off simply enough with a GPS router verbally instructing the driver, who is off camera, to take a specific route to get to their destination during a very late night drive. Through their windshield, we see nearby signs of traffic lights and infrastructure to remind us that we are in a well-populated area, despite the timestamp showing that it's 2 in the morning. The timestamp jumps to around 3 a.m. when the drivers begin leaving the security of the well-lit city. Around 4 a.m. is where we arrive closer to our destination, which seems to be off the beaten path near desolated woodlands. Cut to the 5.30 a.m. timestamp and the driver looks to be in distress rushing to his location. 
There is no explanation or backstory as to why there is such urgency to get to the middle of nowhere. This is when the viewer can begin to sense the impending doom and an inexplicable feeling of dread the closer we get to our destination. Almost as if there's something malicious around the corner, the deeper and deeper you descend into the woods. It's a 3 minute and 30 second roller coaster of confusion that starts off as a night drive but ends in a delirious and unsettling climax that leaves you wondering, what the hell did I just watch? Destination will be 50 feet. You will arrive at your destination. Proceed to the highlighted route. Continue on Holbrook Park Drive, then in 500 feet turn right onto North 38th Street. You will arrive at your destination in 2 hours and 28 minutes. Turn right onto North 38th Street. In a quarter mile, turn left onto Merritt Parkway. You are on the fastest available route. Turn left onto Merritt Parkway, then take the on-ramp to Highway 114 North. Traffic ahead, rerouting. In 10 miles take exit 17, then turn right onto Quarry Utility Road South. You are on the fastest route. In 2.8 miles, keep right to stay on service causeway H516. You will arrive at your destination in 14 minutes. Rerouting. Make a U-turn. Head east for one quarter of a mile, then follow signs for do not enter. Continue on unnamed road, then, in 300 feet, turn off your headlights. On the evening of February 20, 2003, in West Warwick, Rhode Island at approximately 11.07 p.m., an unexpected fire broke out at the station nightclub that ended up killing 100 people and injuring 230 other attendees. The fire was caused by pyrotechnics set off by Great White, that evening's headlining band. Pyrotechnic stunt ignited flammable acoustic foam in the walls and ceiling surrounding the stage. It caused all combustible materials to burn within a minute of the fire starting. An intense black smoke engulfed the entire club within two minutes. Remarkably enough, there was a camera crew at the concert that night that filmed most of the fire as it was happening in real time. Video footage of the fire shows its ignition, rapid growth, the billowing smoke that made a quick escape almost impossible, and the blockades of people that further hindered evacuation. The toxic smoke, heat, and the resulting human rush towards the main exit killed 100 people that night. 230 were injured, and remarkably, another 132 escaped uninjured. The fire started just seconds into the band's opening song, Desert Moon, when pyrotechnics set off by the tour manager named Daniel Bichel ignited flammable acoustic foam on both sides and top center of the drummer section towards the back of the stage. The pyrotechnics produced a controlled spray of sparks from four fireworks that were set to spray 15 feet into the air for 15 seconds. Two fireworks were at 45 degree angles, with the other middle two pointing straight upwards. 
The acoustic foam was installed in two layers with highly flammable urethane foam layered on top of polyethylene foam, the major problem being with the latter. Burning polyethylene foam instantly develops opaque, dark smoke along with deadly carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide gas. Inhaling the smoke only two to three times would cause rapid loss of consciousness and eventually death by internal suffocation. The crowd initially thought the flames were part of the band's act, similar to the music video showing flames blazing around the musicians. In this case, the fire reached the ceiling and when the smoke began to billow uncontrollably downwards, the concert goers began to show concern. 20 seconds after the pyrotechnics ended, the fire continued to spread. In less than one minute, the entire stage was engulfed in flames, with most of the band members and entourage fleeting for the west exit next to the stage. By the time the nightclub's fire alarm was activated, the majority of the crowd headed for the main entrance, even though there were four exits total. To add to the chaos, a group of survivors claimed that a bouncer by the name of Scott Vieira stopped people trying to escape via the stage west exit, stating that the door was for band personnel only. A total of 462 people were in attendance that night, even though the nightclub's official license capacity was 404. 100 individuals died and about half of the survivors were injured either from burns, smoke inhalation, thermal trauma, or crushing. Among those who died in the fire were Great White's lead guitarist Ty Longley and the show's MC DJ Mike Gonzalez. There is reason to believe that Longley and Gonzalez tried to salvage equipment during the early stages of the fire and lost valuable time to escape before dense, toxic smoke made breathing near impossible at zero visibility. It took the fire less than three minutes to reach its peak and killed 100 people whose lives were claimed by the careless act. Through their attorneys, club owners said they did not give permission to the band to use pyrotechnics. Band members claimed that they did have permission. An investigation of the fire using computer simulations and a mock-up of the stage area and dance floor concluded that a properly installed fire sprinkler system would have contained the fire long enough to give everyone time to exit safely. However, because of the nightclub's wooden building being constructed in 1946 and the antiquated fire hazard code set in place, the owners believe the station was exempt from sprinkler system requirements. What many fail to remember is that the building had undergone an occupancy change and the change dissolved its exemption from its grandfathered fire code requirements. And this caused a skew of legal issues that would take almost a decade to resolve. To this day, the incident is still recognized as the fourth deadliest fire outbreak at a nightclub in U.S. history.
anybody inside? Number four, Dancing with a Stranger. Obedece la Morsa, known in English as Obey the Walrus, is a viral video featuring transgender drag queen Sandy Crisp, better known as the Goddess Bunny, who was disabled from a botched surgery after developing childhood polio. The video features herself tap dancing to a distorted version of the Itsy Bitsy Spider, with various awkward clips intended to disorient and frighten the viewer. Many find the video unsettling, having expired countless reaction videos, parodies, and remixes for the past 14 years. The video shows swirling colors and plays a distorted musical track that is sped up, gets lower, and then plays backwards. We see a very thin and skeletal-like woman looking very closely into the camera, tap dancing with a parasol, and at one point has a clown head on top of her head. When it was initially released, many people claimed that there was a curse exposed to anyone who watched the tape. The video is rumored to cause intense feelings of fear while disorienting the mind and creating an overall sense of discomfort to what we are witnessing, which can all be attributed to exaggeration and hysteria. This was around the time when chain letters and cursed Facebook blog posts began to make their circulation back in the mid-2000s. It's been said that there are subliminal messages running through the audio and visual effects of the video, which supposedly convey the instructions to follow me and depict people in a prayer circle, instructing the viewers to commit horrible crimes. The clown head is symbolic of the condemnation of the soul. Further research into conspiracy theories also reveals that the video was originally believed to be the product of a satanic cult that abuses and exploits children. It is called the Cult of the Walrus or La Morsa. The cult is said to be based in Brazil but has factions in Germany. However, all these claims were unfounded when the actual origin and backstory of the tape was divulged. The video is of a transgender woman and drag queen formerly named Johnny Bema but is now known as Sandy Crisp or the stage name Goddess Bunny taken from a 1998 documentary of the same name. The documentary film was released in 1998, but the viral video wasn't uploaded to E-Bombs World until July 3rd, 2006, where it accrued over 250,000 views. The video spread to the Creepypasta Wiki before being uploaded to YouTube on March 15, 2008. As of 2022, the video has racked up a total of 33 million views after being uploaded 14 years ago. We can rest assured the clip is not the product of a cult, nor is it cursed. It is a video that runs an audio track of the song Itsy Bitsy Spider sped up and then played backwards. It creates various disruptive visual images with swirling colors and footage from the Goddess Bunny documentary to put the viewer in a state of uneasiness. All those factors combined were enough to make this carefully crafted video into one of the first ever viral sensations to be posted to the internet. Unfortunately, Sandy Crisp passed away on January 27, 2021, just 14 days after her 61st birthday in Los Angeles, California. Number 5. Fear Thy Neighbor 
One night in October 1976, in an affluent suburb outside Sacramento, California, a woman sleeping in her bed woke up to a masked man wielding a gun and shining a flashlight in her face. He said to her, don't move, don't make a sound, or I will kill you. She is one of more than 40 women believed to have been assaulted by a man who terrorized the Sacramento area during the 1970s. The mysterious attacker, known to police as the Golden State Killer, had never been identified until recently. Incredibly, more than 20 years later, dramatic advancements in law enforcement technology determined that the same man was responsible for a series of murders in the 1980s. Here is the backstory to the recording you are about to hear. During the 1970s, this mystery man would defy detection for decades and establish himself as a unique offender with unusual signature habits, including lingering in victims' homes for hours on end. Evidence recorded near two crime scenes indicated that the killer had spied on his victims prior to the attacks. According to detectives, the killer prowled the area surrounding the victims' homes and knew the neighborhood layouts too well for it to be a random attack. In some of the cases, he knew the victims' names, their daily schedules, and who their neighbors were. In other cases, being at the right place at the right time created more opportunity to terrorize his victims. For example, some of his subjects broke the routine and would arrive at their home while he was coincidentally nearby. The Golden State Killer, or the original Night Stalker, not to be confused with Richard Ramirez, would pursue them based on those circumstances alone. The first 15 attacks occurred in homes only inhabited by women and children, but then the attacker became even more brazen and targeted homes where a man was also present. When the killer would break into the couple's homes, he would order the woman to tie up the man. He would then isolate the woman to the other part of the house where he would also tie her up. Then he would put dishes on the man's back while having them lay on their stomach face down. He would threaten to kill everyone in the house if he heard a dish rattle or break. The entire neighborhood community became filled with fear over the attacks and many rumors were being put out about what he was doing to his victims. In order to help dispel the rumors and give out important information, detectives held town hall meetings to discuss safety precautions. Some residents were outraged to think that a man could have been in the home while these attacks occurred and didn't do anything to defend their wives. During one meeting, a man got up and said, I don't know how this could happen, but if he ever comes into my home, I'm going to be ready. That man and his wife would later become victims to the attacker. The photo of the community meeting has been circulating on Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit since D'Angelo's arrest. People wondering if D'Angelo is one of the audience members. But they are looking at all photos taken during that time period. Carol Daly, one of the original investigators with the Sheriff's Department, also can't verify D'Angelo is seen in this photo. The photo itself, dated November 8, 1977, comes from the Sacramento Bee paper. Paul Holes, one of the lead investigators out of Contra Costa County, obtained a copy of the newspaper clip and the negative of the photo. Haynes said victims number 21 attended a community meeting at Del Deo School on November 3, 1976, where the man criticized the investigation. That man and his wife were later attacked on May 17, 1977. It is not unusual for attackers to want to see the emotional impact and ramifications of their crime, and in order to achieve the same higher rush, they need to escalate the crimes in order to maintain a more impactful reaction. Holding a town meeting to discuss the crime in detail more than likely enticed the attacker, disguised in anonymity within the large crowd to see the effects of his attacks. The sadistic game being played by the killer often extended beyond the physical attacks as well. Several victims reported receiving disturbing phone calls from the attacker years later. Hello? You got three there? Pardon me? Is three there? I'm sorry, Mr. Ron.
Psychologically, this is another strategy used by the attacker to get an adrenaline rush without physically attacking his victims. Calling them in the privacy of their own home to eradicate any type of peace of mind or sense of security shows us that this attacker thrives on being in control of his victim. He loves invoking fear into his attacks and makes sure that he emotionally scars his subjects as much as possible. The cat and mouse aspect of his attacks became a signature style when it came to his victims. And finally, in 2018, thanks to advancements in DNA testing and record keeping, the OG Night Stalker was finally able to be identified. By now, a new moniker was also given to him, dubbing him the Golden State Killer to distinguish him from Richard Ramirez's Night Stalker case. Although Richard Ramirez was apprehended on August 31st, 1985, it wouldn't be until April 25th, 2018 that the Golden State Killer was identified and apprehended. Police arrested 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo and charged him with the murders of a Rancho Cordova couple killed during an evening walk with their dog. DNA testing further linked him to the attacks previously discussed. An investigator solved the case by uploading the then unidentified killer's DNA profile to a public genealogy website. Through the website, they were able to locate a fourth cousin of the killer. They then mapped out a family tree which helped them narrow down their search to D'Angelo, who was a husband and father of three. A DNA sample was taken from trash discarded by him which was found to match the DNA from the crime scenes. And in June 2020, almost 50 years after the initial attack, D'Angelo pleaded guilty to 13 counts of first degree murder and 13 counts of kidnapping in a deal to avoid the death penalty. He received multiple consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole.